see this terrific group here. Um, my name is Amy Kapczynski. I'm a professor of law here at Yale Law School, and um, I co-direct the Law and Political Economy Project, which is hosting this event. Sabil is my other faculty co-director, and I'll mention at the end when they're back in the room some of the other wonderful people who've helped um, make it possible for us to be here today as part of the project. Um, so I wanted to start out by saying why we're so excited to have this convening and um, this incredible uh, group of scholars who work on diverse topics um, that really range across different questions and aspects of the administrative state. Um, so, and I wanted to say a little bit about our project for those of you who aren't familiar with it. So the Law and Political Economy Project is a small, very small organization that really see ourselves as a, a sort of utility or a facilitator and a hub for a much broader group of scholars, students, and uh, practitioners that are interested in recentering questions of a political economy within law schools and within legal debates. And so LPE is really rooted in the notion that law shapes the economy and that the economy shapes law. And that many of the crises of our days, from the climate crisis to crises of inequality and uh, racial and gender subordination, political alienation, sort of hollowing out of our democracy, um, have been shaped by ideas um, that are prevalent in law schools and that filter into legal discourse and policy in various ways and then refracted back. Um, and so we're trying to think about, analyze, criticize, um, uh, these kinds of um, developments and support scholarship and pedagogy that maps where things have gone wrong and develops ideas and proposals um, to democratize our political economy and make it more just, equal, and sustainable. Um, so there is, of course, um, some um, engagement with questions of law and economics as part of this, but I think part of what today's conference reflects and part of what we've really been trying to think about mindfully over the last um, several years is that um, there is a, is a way in which ideas about the economy and how it ought to operate or get deeply embedded across these the so-called public-private distinction. And so we're actually doing quite a lot on um, what you might call public law. Um, so this conference is part of a broader um, series of events this year. There's one about, which is actually a public webinar about the courts and sort of the question of court reform that started last week and will be ongoing. And you can sign up for that online. Um, we have several events coming up here and in New York about the political economy of of civil procedure. Um, and um, we also have a new initiative on law and organizing. And part of that reflects um, the some of the questions that we'll talk about today, that if we have a vision of democratizing the economy, um, some portion of that needs to really rethink questions of how democratic are state institutions that might in fact do more to uh, help us administer the economy actually are. And so sort of thinking about what are the vehicles for organized power among working people in this country um, and how uh, does law either facilitate or inhibit that kind of power. Um, so um, I'm really delighted to thank Sabil and Blake for helping put this together. Um, also Helia, Corinne and Sarah uh, who are out there. Uh, James, all members of the project who both um, support this and other work that we do. Um, thank you also to many of you in the room who've written for the project and obviously come um, and um, spent your time here or who uh, have engaged in your own work uh, with us or otherwise on these important questions. Um, you know, and I think the premise of today is that we are really in the middle of an important sort of intellectual moment of, of ferment um, and, and trying to build new frameworks together, right? None of this is happening with people um, alone making an intellectual breakthrough, but hopefully many of us together um, uh, can, can do that. So part of why I think I am interested as somebody who does not study administrative law <laughs> um, and has never really worked in that um, domain is so excited to have a conference on the administrative state and um, of course engaging questions of administrative law is that broadly, if we're thinking about democratizing the economy, that will require us to traverse many questions of administration and how the administrative state can be accountable, how it can also um, have the capacity that is needed to do the work um, imagined with, for example, an energy transition. Um, and yet there's good reasons to be skeptical of strong uh, state power, given how it's been exercised in the past and its capacity to concentrate power in the hands of elites and exclude um, uh, democratic claims. 
And so clearly, uh, administrative law has, has been grappling with these issues for many years. But I think, as, as Blake and Sabil will say, say more about, there's a sense of both an inflection point in administrative law, both because of changes coming from the courts and, 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 um, and also critiques internal to the prevailing paradigm. Um, and um, and there are ways in which I think part of what our conversation today will reflect is that there are missing components uh, or or um, uh, opportunities to rethink some aspects that had not historically really been featured in a narrower conversation about administrative law. Um, so let me um, let me um, uh, just say one more thanks to those who helped us organize, including also the staff here at the law school who are of course busy doing things <laughs> to make it possible for us to be here and not in the room. Um, but maybe we could just give a round of applause to the organizers and then I'll turn it over. to I think you're also probably aware, but the event is being live streamed. And so um, uh, I think that means that, you know, be aware of that as you make your comments as we are. Um, choose my words carefully. Choose your words carefully, Blake. <laughs> well, thank you, Amy. And and and, and thanks to uh, to Amy and to Sabiel and to, the, uh, to Helia and Corinne and all the, the LPE and uh, Yale Law School staff for making this this happened. I want to. I want to leave most of our introductory time over to Sabiel to to frame the discussion. Uh, but you know, since this, since this is an, an LPE event, I want to uh, start dialectically uh, by talking about what this event is not about. Um, it's not. It's and, and and that'll tell us what it actually maybe is about. Um, is it, it, it's not about the Supreme Court. Um, it is not about everything the Supreme Court is uh, doing and undoing. Uh, in administrative law, um, uh, but uh, in in a sense, it is it is uh, triggered and inspired by it, right? Uh, so one thing that's that's remarkable about the Supreme Court's public law jurisprudence, and especially in administrative law, is that the the Roberts Court uh, has is in the process of articulating a political theory um, of of the Constitution um, of the administrative state to the extent that it will continue to exist. Uh, that emphasizes democracy um, and liberty as these two values that are threatened by uh, giving discretionary authority to government agencies, uh, and, but primarily uh, regulatory agencies such as the Securities and Exchange Commission or the Federal Trade Commission or the National Labor Relations Board. And if you think about the kind of subject matter agenda uh, of, of LPE, um, it, 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 it is targeted at these kind of areas, right? So regulating the marketplace and thinking about how, how the government constitution uh, constitutes economic relations in and through legal rules. Uh, if you think about labor, the, the labor market and, 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 and union rights and organizing, uh, if you think about uh, to what extent the, 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 the securities markets and the commodities markets ought to be subject to collective democratic control. These are the primary subject matters of LPE that are, that are, uh, currently uh, in the Supreme Court's crosshairs in cases like uh, like Jarkizi uh, before the Supreme Court right now about whether the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, has the authority uh, to adjudicate cases of securities fraud or whether that is unconstitutional. Um, and so, so I think the question that's put on the table for us is, uh, is there a is there a countervailing or contrasting theory of of freedom? And of democracy uh, to be put on the table. I think what you know, one of the dynamics in recent years has been that there's a much more traditional story about administrative law that doesn't speak in the register of ultimate political values. That speaks in the register of competence, of, of legislative authorization, um, of of whatever the statute says goes for the most part, uh, technocratic competence, uh, and doesn't really speak so much in the register of equality uh, or of you know achieving some kind of a just social vision. Um, and but that is the register that the Roberts Court is speaking in now. And so perhaps the call for public law more broadly and specifically on the left um, is to join issue on that, a join issue on what democracy means in our contemporary environment and what freedom would entail in the context of an economy that is highly complex, highly concentrated and highly unequal, what it would demand of the public and what it would demand of the state um, to respond to those kinds of uh, exercises of arbitrary power and unequal distributions of wealth and opportunity. So uh, I'll leave it there and turn it over to Sabiel. Great. Um, well, I have the, the the best part of the intro uh, duties, which is to give you all a teaser and preview of all the amazing 
ideas, scholars, thinkers that uh, we're going to hear from over the course of uh, the next day, day and a half. Um, but let me first pick up where uh, Blake left off, right? I think, so we titled this conference Administering a Democratic Political Economy uh, on purpose, right? Because I think what we are hoping to convey or hoping to work through together over the next day and a half, as Amy and uh, uh, Blake highlighted, is, you know, for the kind of small d democracy that we want to have or ought to want to have, right, a democracy that treats all of us as truly equal humans with equal standing and dignity um, and structures market and social and political relations accordingly, uh, we're going to need to, we're going to need government institutions to make that happen. And one way to think about sort of the the defensive crouch moment we might be in context of the court, I would also name uh, some of the very increasingly explicit calls to uh, dismantle the federal civil service, for example, that we're hearing from uh, folks running for office, uh, partic uh, particular folks running for office. Um, is So in addition to that defensive crouch, I think we're, regardless of what happens over the next year, I would argue that we are going to need over the next decade plus to reimagine our administrative institutions, either because they will be significantly curtailed or, or, or destroyed, or because just the fact of the things we need to do to remedy structural injustice, to deal with climate change, to tackle you know, new threats of AI and technology, what have you, um, the things we need to do are going to require a, a very different kind of governance. Um, and one of the through lines, or, or, or I think uh, intramural debates among the different papers you're going to hear is, um, how much can we leverage or piggyback off of the institutions we have already? And how much are we going to need like full scale revamp, rethink, you know, kind of rebuild anew? Um, so so uh, let me say a, a little bit about um, some of these these through lines. Uh, the first is this uh, a number of the papers, uh, uh, Professor Omarova, Lisko, uh, uh, Amy and uh, Joel Michaels piece, Andrew Hammond, among others, are really thinking about what kind of institutions would we would we need to, for example, have uh, publicly driven investment to have to do, to do infrastructure, to do industrial policy, to tackle the climate crisis in the ways that we ought to want to do uh, in a way that serves others. Uh, we have a a complementary set of papers uh, that are really thinking: Professor Shaw, uh, uh, Emily Chertoff, uh, uh, Professor Milligan, Professor Tani, um, who are really thinking about. Um, the deep ways in which the administrative state has already baked into it uh, a set of structures and practices and norms that encode and perpetuate the very inequities that we're trying to contest. And that poses a real challenge, right, about how much can we then, wh what does the constructive project look like given that reality or given that critique? Uh, that's some problem diagnosis in a sense. Um, but I think all the papers are also very much uh, thinking about not just the institutional structures, but the the conceptual apparatus we bring to bear to governing, right? So if we think about uh, the neoliberal imaginary, which we've talked a little bit about, but not not a ton about yet, um, one way to think about neoliberalism as a way of doing government, and this is like both on the left and the right, uh, of, I would argue for previous decades, is it's a um, elite, a preference for private ordering, a skepticism of state power and often a uh, a presumption, or I would say an, uh, an eraser even, of the kind of structural inequities that we ought to want to contest because we take the current baseline as given, right? If the current way that society operates is the default baseline, then, and changes are sort of layered on top of that, reforms layered on top of that, that's already kind of baking into the equation, a set of historical injustices and inequities that we want to try to like figure out how to do better about, right? Um, and so these are all ways, assumptions in, in how we think about government and how we think about policy that uh, then sort of have long ripple effects in policy design, institutional design. And so then we have a number of papers, uh, including the ones I mentioned, but then other ones, you know, Professor uh, uh, Havasey, Blake's piece, uh, 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 Kate Jackson's piece, um, a number of, of the, the papers that are really thinking about, okay, how would we rethink our core con like conceptual models of administration and administrative law? Right. And I won't I won't preview the papers because they're, they're, everyone's going to tell tell you about their papers as well. Um, yeah, I would I would put uh, uh, Lebanon and Noah Rosenblum's piece in, in this in this frame as well. Uh, and then the last theme that I'd highlight uh, is that this idea of the the kind of the spectrum of what reform or transformation looks like. 
So a number of the, of the papers is somewhat I'll talk about in a, in a little bit, um, going back to uh, Andrew Hammond's piece, for example. Um, a number of the papers are really imagining uh, more, more and different juice we can squeeze out of the car current structures, right? And, and to good effect. Um, a number of the other papers are are pushing us to think more um, uh, transformationally, right? We might well need to uh, wholesale rethink vast parts of our administrative apparatus if we want to make good on the kind of uh, democracy that Amy and, and Blake test about. So, by way of closing, I think what it offers like we're gonna we're gonna hear a lot over the course of the next day and a half. I think it's gonna be really exciting. Um, I think for for me, part of what makes uh, this LPE space so critical so needed. Is it? It's. We're, I think we're trying to hold in this conversation a, a bunch of different sort of um, postures at the same time, critical but also constructive, right? Visionary but also tangible, like the real things that we could do. And there's things that we really need to think like blue sky about. Um, and we're doing all of that at the same time. And the papers do this uh, beautifully. Um, and and we're going to hear from everyone over the course of the day. Um, so let me. Pause there. We're actually running a tiny bit early, but I think that's okay. Yeah. Right. And we can move into uh, our main event. So uh, if you just give us a, a minute to uh, bring our first panel up here uh, and then we can get rolling. Panel. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, so uh, this is panel one uh, structural injustice in the administrative state. Um, uh, I, I, I'm the moderator and commenter. Uh, I'm Nick Perillo uh, from Yale Law School, uh, and uh, we will be hearing um, from Bijal Shah of uh, Boston College Law School, who will be discussing her paper, Administrative Subordination, uh, then from Karen Tani uh, of the University of Pennsylvania Law School and History Department, who will discuss her paper, They Were the Cotton, Agency Under Enforcement and Vulnerability Profiteering. And finally, uh, from Sabil Rahman uh, of, uh, of Cornell Law School, who will discuss his paper, uh, Structural Change uh, and the we Rewiring of the Administrative State. Uh, so uh, we'll begin with uh, Bijal Shah. Thanks, Nick, for those introductions. And thank you to the organizers, Sabil, Amy, Blake, and everyone for putting this together. It's so necessary. Thanks for inviting me to participate. So. Administrative agencies ensure that our government is functional, but they also hold an immense amount of power over almost every aspect of our lives. Um, <clears throat> you'll have to excuse me, I've lost my voice a little, so maybe I'll bring it a little closer. Is that better? Yes? Okay, terrific. So, you know, in recent years, it's become commonplace among conservative academics, government officials, and even Supreme Court justices to attack the administrative state as unconstitutional and politically unaccountable. And the response to this from those of us who hold a more moderate stance is to rightfully emphasize the, that agencies are well suited to forming and administering policy because they're efficient and because they're expert, particularly in comparison to Congress. Progressive scholars and policymakers also believe that agencies are key players in measures to mitigate climate change, to expand infrastructures of welfare and tackle dangerous concentrations of political power over foreign and national security. However, administrative agencies have also consistently engaged in policy and decision-making that excludes or leads to poor results for communities of color and other marginalized groups in domains like immigration, welfare and safety, and environmental protection. Indeed, agencies sometimes treat poorly, consider differently, make distinctions against, or permit subpar outcomes for vulnerable communities. Now, the pertinent scholarship on this topic often assumes one of two things. One, that these problems are idiosyncratic and may be specific to the bias of certain administrators, or two, that they're based in a foundation of racism or discrimination, pure and simple, or some combination of these. So examples include the xenophobia and counter-Muslim narratives of immigration law and the racism and anti-poverty bias identified by environmental justice advocates. Now, in my project, I'm asking, do these types of problems simply illustrate unvarnished biased? Are they the result of individualized arbitrariness in administration? Or is there something, something else going on or something else also going on? And so the response, uh, I, or uh, in response, I argue that agencies harm vulnerable communities, not only due to a lack of consideration of minority interests, or even due to situational bias, but also in order to pursue administrative virtues, 
So in other words, to do things like reduce institutional burdens, to improve efficiency, to conserve time, money, resources, and to preserve the structures that underlie agencies' overall power to regulate. So put another way, I observe that agencies subordinate the interests of minorities across areas such as national security, immigration, and environmental protection in order to pursue values that actually help the government function. Sometimes it's precisely those efforts that allow an agency to respond to challenges quickly that lead to harm against racial minorities. Other times, in an effort to direct funding and resources mindfully, agencies ultimately engage in policies that harm underserved and marginalized people. And importantly, these problems are a consequence of how agencies have been structured from the mid-20th century around the time of FDR and the advent of the modern administrative state through today. In particular, it's the top-down hierarchies and multifaceted missions that characterize some of the most well-known and powerful agencies like the Department of Homeland Security that have fostered the most concerning administrative outcomes as they pertain to vulnerable communities. A conventional justification for the existence of agencies is that they act in the public interest and public interest theories of regulation value criteria such as efficiency. But to the extent institutional values like efficiency actually result in harm to people, this means that agencies may cause harm while acting in the public interest. Uh, and this is counterintuitive. I think, particularly from the perspective of liberals and progressives, including me, who advocate for an expansive discretionary bureaucracy in the face of conservative efforts, for instance, to install a unitary um, and more politically responsive executive branch. Okay, so uh, listen, no institutional driver justifies a harmful process or outcome for vulnerable or marginalized communities, but agencies work under pressure to act efficient, efficiently, and they work in the shadow of scarcity. And so administrative actors are motivated to pursue bureaucratic values and maintain the structures that undergird their power in order to preserve and expand the administrative state. And so it's important for, for all of us, for theorists, critics, advocates, policymakers, to understand that agencies are often trading off between divergent incentives and goals. That is between an interest in self-preservatory and arguably good administration and the value of ensuring that administration doesn't harm vulnerable people. So what are some of the administrative priorities that lead to harmful agency behavior? I'll highlight some of the, the cases that I look at in my project. Um, an, an important administrative resource is time. Increasing the speed at which tasks are completed saves an agency time, which it can spend selectively. But time efficiency has trade-offs, including the possibility that the policy resulting from speedier process is of lower quality, and that more efficient process may encourage agencies to overlook important alternatives. Um, one way that such time efficiency is accomplished is by what I call uh, by use of what I call information proxies. So sometimes your bureaucrats will make assumptions based on data that's quicker and easier to obtain. And in doing so, agencies can save both time and effort. People can serve as proxies for information. For instance, uh, David Zaring, Elena Bayliss uh, note that anti-terrorism law targets proxy groups, namely undocumented immigrants in lieu of terrorists in order to accomplish its goals. The, disc the discretionary administrative use of arrest records also serves as an information proxy. Uh, Isha Jane notes that at the federal level, arrest records are used to make decisions about who to deport, notwithstanding whether or not the non-citizen was actually convicted. The problem, of course, is that arrests are unreliable proxies for unlawful immigration, which leads to the higher deportation of non-citizens who have brushed up against the criminal enforcement system. Agencies also save time by curtailing administrative procedure. So some praise this as an antidote to the procedural fetish that burdens agencies with ever-growing procedural requirements. But this can also encourage exclusionary and biased decision-making outcomes. For instance, the Bureau of Land Management approves oil and gas leases, which leads to extractive projects. On the one hand, the agency can accomplish more projects due to an expedited environmental review and the imposition of more narrow standards that often focus these leases in rural communities. On the other hand, um, this approach has led to haphazard leasing uh, that does not anticipate adverse impacts on certain communities, particularly threats, threats to the indigenous community um, and native women in particular that result from boom towns that originate in major oil and gas leasing activities. Another incentive driving agencies is the preservation of tangible resources and institutional capacity as these are limited. Uh, however, this can lead to inadequate governmental support for communities that have historically been denied access to administrative resources. 
So David Super has discussed the harms of administrative parsimony in the context of emergency preparedness and management. Uh, more specifically, FEMA has managed its institutional history of limited resources by employing a systematic approach in which the agency purposefully leaves important decisions, including those involving funding, until the last minute out of scarcity and necessity. But as we all know, FEMA's failure to allocate adequate resources to stave off severe risks in New Orleans, risks that the agency had previously recognized, resulted in the fa failure to evacuate tens of thousands of vulnerable low-income people from New Orleans in the wake of Hurricane Katrina. In the food and safety context, while implementing a statute with special provisions for safeguarding children from pesticides, the EPA failed to investigate the riskiest pesticides as required by statute. Now, it did this both because that data is difficult to obtain and because uh, it's costly and burdensome to evaluate that data effectively. But in doing so, the agency ignored pesticides with high risk factors and uh, ended up facing an NRDC lawsuit filed on behalf of children that were harmed by pesticides as a result. So finally, oof, I think I'm two minutes over. <laughs> um, I've been trying to speak slowly, but I'll go even quiet, you know. All right, so finally, agency structure can also lead to conflicting functions and mandates that lead to harm. So institutional pressure can arise from a conflation of or conflict between divergent mandates across regulatory areas. Now, I'm not referring here to the impact of presidentialism or political actors on agencies. Rather, I'm focusing on a more internal dynamic. So the pressure posed or imposed by larger agencies on their subcomponents. Uh, more specifically, in an agency with multiple lower level subcomponents, the mission of the parent agency can conflict with subcomponent efforts to pursue distinct policy mandates. So we all know after 9-11, DHS was created and the Department of Justice um, uh, Immigration and Naturalization Service was replaced in part by the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, which was then placed in DHS. But DHS's national security mandate often overwhelms USCIS's humanitarian immigration uh, goals. Likewise, FEMA was also pl placed in DHS, and there's been some um, some uh, sort of good information that has come out showing how the transition to this placement actually substantially damaged FEMA's national uh, natural disaster and, and other sort of missions. Um, okay, so why is all of this a problem? Well, I, I think it's worth better understanding the incentives that drive agencies to harm minority and vulnerable communities. Um, and that it's important to consider how to ameliorate these dynamics. In a sense, this, this study is an introduction of systemic bias into the conversation about administrative legitimacy. Um, now, superficially, I know that I'm privileging, uh, you know, democratic legitimacy, civil liberties, transparency, and accountability over values that are often associated with institutionalism. Um, but the administrative subordination of minorities to bureaucratic values is arguably an affront to both legitimacy and functionality, to the extent that functionality is measured not only by improvements in efficiency and reductions in cost, but also by the extent to which the agency can meet its designated goals, foster good outcomes, and uphold um, important values such as fair and just administration. Okay, so in the last minute and a half, I'm happy to talk more about this in Q&A. What can we do about this? Um, I come from administrative law where, you know, the crits believe that explaining that there's a problem is a contribution enough, but I also feel pressure to provide solutions. <laughs> so I've, I've imagined some solutions for an era where, you know, they might be viable politically. Um, conventionally solutions for improving agency responsiveness to marginalized communities involve empowering the vulnerable by acquiring political support, by acquiring electoral representation. They involve impact litigation. In other words, advocates and people, mar marginalized people themselves are expected to shoulder the burden. Um, I, in this project, am trying to remain consistent with a focus on dynamics driven by structures and incentives that are internal to agencies. And so my solutions as well focus on uh, internal legitimacy <clears throat> and consider prescriptions that might impact agencies without uh, forcing advocates or judges to be the drivers of that impact. Okay, so... Uh, in line with this, I propose some incremental institutional design or redesign. Um, advance, advancements to agency design can be made from the top down, uh, prompted by Congress, including through sort of specific targeted earmarks and riders that might shift agencies' incentives to seek out better quality information. Um, Congress could also create targeted statutory requirements for administrative process um, in, in certain contexts. 
Uh, for instance, enhanced reason giving requirements could force DHS to make different choices or guide uh, the Bureau of Land Management to make different leasing decisions. Um, bottom up structural change could originate from within the executive branch. Uh, so many have suggested that agencies aren't necessarily hardwired by the structural design choices made by politicians. And so agencies could themselves could seek to push back against institutional preferences for speed or efficiency. They might avoid regulatory fail failures like those caused by the EPA. Um, Liz McGill has also argued that agencies sometimes li limit their procedural freedoms. So agencies could also better ensure minority interests are taken into full consideration by kind of creating more fulsome procedure for themselves. And finally, you know, conversations about agency redundancy and conflict assume that the highest administrative goal is to further a single mission. And there are definitely benefits to centralization, which I have explored in my own work. Uh, but examples like the Department of Homeland Security suggest that subcomponents with competing missions can be buried by umbrella agency mandates. And so decentralization could help. This is not a call to abolish ICE per se, but it is an argument for dismantling the national security apparatus and for reconstructing welfare-oriented agencies in purposeful ways. So some quick examples, USCIS, if that were removed from DHS, this would, could benefit USCIS's mission. And in the wake of Katrina, Congress actually acted with a similar instinct by redefining FEMA as a distinct agency under DHS and redefining its primary mission, as well as designating the FEMA administrator as a principal advisor to the president and the Sec secretary of Homeland Security. In other words, redefining and insulating FEMA's mission vis-a-vis -vis pressures from DHS as a result of what happened in Katrina. Um, okay. Thanks for listening. I look forward to our conversation. Uh, thank you. And we'll now hear from Karen Tani. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And thanks to the organizers for letting me sneak on this program with a very early stage paper. Uh, as a few of you know, I've been working for some years on a historical book project that is on what I've been calling disability governance. So the project interrogates um, the post-1965 explosion of laws and policies that focused explicitly on disabled people and that attach particular rights and benefits to the category of disability. So the question driving this is, you know, why was it suddenly so important to see and demarcate disabled people and to legislate their care and inclusion? The disability rights movement is part of that story, but the movement was relatively relatively small and its rise postdated some of the most important legislation. So the question driving the project is what work were disability laws and policies doing for this state? Um, to some extent, of course, these laws were an expansion of a longstanding liberal project aimed at providing access and opportunity to marginalized groups. Uh, but these laws also intersected with other projects. Um, so I'll just give a few examples before diving into the, um, the one that's the focus of this paper. Um, so consider, for example, public programs that provide financial support to people who have become too disabled to work. So yes, these programs are a form of social provisioning, but they were also a way of dealing with economic restructuring and evading conversations about why and how disablement occurred. These programs also tacitly legitimize employers' narratives about who could be a productive citizen and who could not. Another example, my research also illuminates the work that disability-based income support programs did within our federalist system. So for example, in the 1980s and 1990s, after the demise of general revenue sharing, a number of state governments launched initiatives to shift people off of state-funded welfare programs and onto disability-based supplemental security income. In other words, they were encouraging people to claim disability, not out of um, compassion or benevolence, but so that the state government could save money. Um, so this paper is picking up on these themes by looking at the administration of another disability-related government benefit which is Medicaid. Uh, the paper focuses specifically on disabled and elderly individuals who are using Medicaid to receive long-term care in nursing homes. Now, Medicaid, of course, is supposed to ensure care, but there are many indications that nursing homes fail in this regard and have long failed. So the extraordinary COVID-19 death toll, I'm sure you've heard about this. This is just one example. And in the meantime, Medicaid payments easily pass through their ostensible beneficiaries and into other hands. So as I'll, I'll explain in a minute, Medicaid payments have generated profits for private companies, created slush funds for local health systems, and padded the coffers of state governments. So this paper intersects with the theme of the conference in that by all accounts, the nursing home industry is heavily regulated. 
The key federal agency here is the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS, and it appears to have lots of rules and tools at its disposal. Sabil might correct me on this later on, but my outside perspective is that it does. And yet for decades, there have been complaints about nursing home abuse, inadequate care, and rampant profiteering. Um, one could diagnose this um, situation as one of regulatory failure, and a number of smart scholars have done that. These scholars have also offered some really great ideas about regulatory improvements. But as um, I think Sabil flagged in his opening remarks, um, this paper is one of those ones that has a different kind of takeaway, um, which might look familiar to readers of my prior work, not that you should be familiar with it, but I'll flag to you kind of my own take on agencies. I I have always been less interested in what agencies should be doing or could be doing better or shouldn't be doing at all. And I have been more interested in what they actually do. And I think there's an opportunity here to see governance in action and to build theory about what kind of state or regime we are living under. So what this paper brings into view, drawing on the work um, of other scholars that I admire, um, is a state that recognizes an obligation to care for those in need, but allows other actors, including other state actors, to treat people in need as a sort of raw material. It doles out life-sustaining benefits in such a manner that powerful entities can quickly and easily extract value without necessarily providing meaningful care. Okay, so with that overview, I'll provide a bit more detail. So the paper begins with a nursing home abuse case that was on the Supreme Court's docket last term. Blake, I know this is not supposed to be about the Supreme Court. So believe me, this is just kind of the entry point into the topic. Um, so the, the case was Health and Hospital Corporation versus Tlefsky. And the people who originally filed the case were family members of an elderly and disabled nursing home resident. And the question uh, presented to the court was, it was about the permissibility of using a private lawsuit to enforce the guarantees of the Federal Nursing Home Reform Act, the court's decision hewed closely to that important question. My paper points to an underappreciated through line in the case, right, running through lots of the briefs, but not really discussed in the opinion, which is the failure of state and federal regulators to prevent or correct the conditions that the Tlefsky family complained about. Now, it could be that the parties and their allies kind of played up these values these failures to substantiate their argument that private lawsuits must remain uh, an enforcement option. But at the same time, I don't think we should ignore, for example, the 16 former health and human services um, senior officials who filed an amicus brief asserting, quote, system, system, systemic failures of regulation. Um, also highly, highly revealing was the brief of law professor Daniel Hatcher, who documented CMS's tolerance of state and local funding arrangements that were at odds with Medicaid's fiscal effort requirements requirements, and that gave state regulators a clear incentive to tolerate inadequate care in government-owned facilities. It's kind of hard to summarize Hatcher's research um, in this length of time. It's, it's very complex, but the general point is that in some states, these complicated intra intrastate transfers and taxes have allowed Medicaid money to basically flow through nursing homes and ultimately get diverted to other state and local uses. And CMS has felt um, unwilling or unable to do much about it. Okay, so my paper takes that Tlefsky case and then looks back in time. It provides a brisk overview of the rise of the nursing home industry, focusing on the economic shifts that reduced uh, families' ability to provide in-home care and on the importance of Medicare and Medicaid. Um, so these programs matter because they functioned as a guaranteed revenue, revenue stream for nursing home operators. Companies have also found ways of using real estate and um, related party contracts to make nursing homes profitable. This part of the paper also uh, details nursing home abuse and neglect. This is a very uh, bleak history. Uh, this abuse and neglect led in 1987 to the enactment of the Federal Nursing Home Reform Act, which provided greater patient protections and gave CMS more enforcement tools. But as you may know, problems have continued. They have been very well documented um, through various uh, political administrations. Okay, so as I said in my initial remarks, we could move from here towards a conversation about administrative solutions. And I think other scholars have done that very capably. Um, I am more interested in what this administrative case study might suggest about contemporary American governance. Um, so building on the work of other social welfare scholars and drawing on the insights of disabled activists, I suggest in this next part of the paper that perhaps the welfarist aspects of our governmental system are no longer understandable either through the paradigm of care 
or through the more kind of critical paradigm of social regulation, right? This is the Piven and Cloward famous thesis about regulating the poor. So I think that the reigning paradigm combines social regulation and extraction. So naming the extraction piece is important, I think, because it helps us understand that people in need are no longer no longer simply considered like a problem for the government to manage. They're also now understood as a resource that can be mined. And they can be mined, ironically, because of the legacies of an earlier state formation in which benefits were fixed to certain individuals in the form of entitlements. These same entitlements now function as a revenue stream for others. And the vision that originally animated those entitlements entitlements has become um, ever harder to see. Uh, my paper concludes actually on a more helpful note, but hopeful note, believe it or not, so derived from some archival research. So when I was looking around in the papers of Wade Blank, he's this Denver-based disability rights activist, I learned about how he and a collection of nursing home residents in the mid-1970s um, escaped the system that I have described. So he was a worker in this for-profit nursing home, right? He had seen the very dark side of that system. Uh, he described it in an oral history as, quote, like a plantation. Only they, like meaning the residents, were the cotton. Like that's so that's the gist of the um, title of the paper. Um, but eventually he and a group of disabled and non-disabled allies managed to scrap together resources, including interestingly, a settlement from a nursing home abuse lawsuit to create an alternative to the nursing home. They created this independent living community that still exists called Atlantis. And it used residents' entitlements to provide adequate care for residents. It also became a hub for activism with close links to a radical group called ADAPT, famous in the 80s and 90s for demanding accessible transit. Um, so I think then the lessons of this paper are twofold and I'll close here. So one, I think there's something profound to be learned about how um, nursing homes are run and how they are regulated. And it speaks to the status and value of a large swath of the US population. And two, um, going back to the archival piece, I think even within a troubled system, we can find examples of alternatives as well as a tradition of naming and resisting extraction. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And we'll now hear from Sabil Rahman. Great. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting with but but both um, Bijal and Karen have, have put on the table. So I'm excited to like skip to the next part where we actually all get to talk to, to one another and hear from you all. But um, but let me say a little bit about about this piece, which um, part of what was so uh, helpful for me to sort of engage and be on this kind of shared discussion with with uh, Karen and Bijal is that I, I think this this orientation towards like the actual functioning of governance is so helpful and important. Um, and I'd say that not just as someone who like had the chance to spend some time in government recently, um, but now I'm wearing my scholar hat, obviously. Um, uh, but I think it, it goes to a lot of like what is often missed, right? At that very like high altitude level of, uh, of, of administrative law doctrine. And we're going to hear a lot about that obviously over the course of the day. So like, you know, I'm an admin law guy at the end of the day. So I still care about that. Um, but so for my piece, I think what I uh, was interested in trying to think through is what might different configurations of the inner workings of administrative protocol and practice and, and operations look like. So it's very similar to what both uh, Vijal and Karen were, were um, suggesting in their pieces. And maybe as a way of getting into that, um, I would start with just like a very basic observation. Uh, Agency is like any organization's collection of humans. Right, they're people who have to organize themselves or be organized and operate collectively, and that requires a set of presumptions, assumptions, some of which are explicit, some of which are implicit. It requires a set of like uh, internal processes and protocols that allow us to like then do our work as a matter of day to day uh, practice and behavior. It allows uh, it requires different kinds of information, right? We all talked about data. It requires different kinds of information, inputs that are coming in, a sense of like the external stakeholders in uh, in, in the world. So there's like a lot of stuff that goes into this, and every organization is like this, right? Um, and so what I started to think about is what, how do we make the most out of these organizations of, of, of as it looks, uh, often supremely talented and capable and like extremely hardworking, right? Um, uh, public servants uh, who are trying to, to uh, serve a mission with uh, highly constrained resources um, and, and highly constrained sort of uh, 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 legal authorities in, in some cases, but not in others to Karen's point. So that's kind of where, where I'm coming from. Uh, and going back to where we started the day, uh, for me, the under, the underlying way of thinking about governance uh, 
is a particular interest. And if if we think sort of neoliberal governance having a set of presumptions about um, about how the, the boundaries of the state, right, the, the, even the notion that we ought not to regulate this whole chain of action that we are actually funding, um, that comes from a, a set of presumptions about what is the proper role of the state. Um, the, some of the, the uh, presumptions that Vidal talked about too, I think there's a set of presumptions about the boundaries of the state, the role of the public versus the private, uh, what types of baseline inequities are cognizable and tractable for regulation. Those are sort of some of the assumptions we're starting with. Uh, one thing I think is really interesting, though, is in if you look at back at the last few years, I think you can see some attempts uh, in, the, in, in the current administration uh, and building on sort of other uh, scholarship and ideas to, to, ex to experiment with a different way of thinking. And so here, let me just give a couple of concrete examples, and then let me say what I take away from this. Um, some of you may be familiar with the president's uh, uh, executive order on advancing equity. Uh, I would note, uh, importantly, that executive order uh, defined equity quite broadly. So not just on uh, uh, as a matter of racial equity, but also looking at disparities of geography, disability, uh, uh, sex and gender. The, the point being that there are many constituencies who whose interests and needs and voices are not centered, right, um, in the day-to-day -day operations of, of government, and that's something that, you know, ought to change. Uh, that executive order then tasked agencies with coming up with action plans and sort of uh, doing, it set up, it's actually, if you read it, it's actually a process-heavy executive order. It doesn't spell out particular specific things that agencies should do necessarily, but it created a structure and a process through which agencies should then think about these ideas. Um, I'll give a second example, and then I'll come back to it. Uh, the executive order on competition came out a few months later. Uh, that one is, has a very different flavor. Um, uh, it laid out a long list of very specific actions that agencies were uh, uh, then going to consider. For example, USDA is going to consider how the Packers and Stockyards Act from many decades ago actually requires or might uh, might require some uh, a different way of thinking about how the current um, uh, uh, market structure of the poultry industry, for example, need, might need to be looked at in another way. Um, we can talk about that. But so, so that's a, another example. But to me, what is interesting about these two executive orders, it is a way of bringing a particular lens to the construction and understanding and response to public problems. Statutory authorities are already there. The agencies have been engaged and in, in, uh, actively engaged in many of these sectors already. So it's not like a new thing in a sense. But what is new about it is sort of a, uh, a different way of thinking about and understanding what the nature of the problems are that need to be diagnosed and then responded to. So that's interesting to me as a way of, uh, of, of a different way of thinking about the problem, right? Uh, so that's one, there's some paper talks about a whole set of interventions that are in this level of like conceptualizing structure, political economy, power, equity, and making it cognizable and tractable in the day-to-day -day operations of the administrative state. Um, the, the second piece that I talk about in the paper is this idea of uh, uh, what I call sort of re a rediscovery of public provision. Um, here, I also sort of engage a lot with the, the literature on uh, welfare programs uh, and the ways in which we sort of have inherited a, a sort of gendered and racialized modes of implementing those programs. You know, the, the amount of paperwork you have to fill out to get access to disability, uh, you know, conveys a baseline, you know, uh, 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 disapproval at best um, or hostility at worst towards the folks we're trying to help, right? Um, and then you see, you know, in a, in a whole bunch of different uh, actions and guidances and so on, uh, an attempt to think differently about it. You know, Paperwork Reduction Act statutorily commands agencies to reduce the burden on Americans with paperwork. Burden is is not just a burden on business, it is a burden on the individuals who need access to those programs to which they are already statutorily and regulatorily entitled. So it's not a new, right? the thing is, this is a thing that's already meant to get to certain people. And, but we have administered it in a way that um, conveys a very different um, set of normative views about who ought to get those benefits, right? And so, so you start to see a different way of like operating that on, on a day-to-day -day level. Um, the the third part of the paper uh, talks about some of the ideas of analysis and data that um, uh, Bijal was talking about. 
Um, here, I, I won't say too much about OMB Circular A4, because if you get me going, I can say a lot about OMB Circular A4, which I uh, love dearly, especially the new one, um, which folks should look at. Uh, but I will say that um, there, too, you see an attempt to put into day-to-day -day practice a different, a, a, an updated way of thinking about analysis, right? There's discussion there that sort of up, updates, for example, the discount rate and other climate folks, uh, the folks in the room here who have worked on this tremendously um, uh, can say better than me, but, you know, the science has improved tremendously over the last 20 years, and we just have different data and information about how we ought to weigh the long-term effects of climate change, for example. Um, or uh, if you look at another part, it actually spells out how might you go about doing uh, distributional analysis in a regulation. Again, sort of very familiar to academic literature and scholarship, but, you know, kind of hard to do if it's a new thing for you and you're an agency. Um, you know, the, uh, this is another sort of example of a different, trying to encode into the day-to-day -day practice a different analytical framework, which then feeds into the kind of day-to-day -day practice, or ought to, I hope, feed into uh, a different kind of day-to-day -day practice, right? If agencies are meant to um, consider all the different imp relevant impacts and implications of their proposals, to not consider, wait, thank you, to not consider distributional effects or impacts on human dignity or impacts on climate is in fact a failure to consider all the, the relevant factors that agencies are, are meant to consider. Um, the last uh, piece that I highlight here, and then in my last minute, let me zoom back out because this is very weedsy. Um, the last piece I wanna highlight here is a set of guidances on uh, public participation. So the executive order on equity, the second executive order on equity, and the executive order on um, uh, modernizing regulatory review, to name just three, but this is in other executive orders too, um, all in different ways, uh, really strongly encourage agencies to think about how they might better engage proactively and early with the constituencies who are most impacted by their, their authorities, by their policymaking agendas. You know, uh, by the time a regulation makes its way to notice and comment, right, there's a lot of work has already been done. I don't want to say it's already cooked, but, you know, there's like the room for maneuver after notice and comment is much less, right, because you've already formulated a set of uh, proposals. And notice and comment only covers one slice of the things that agencies do, right? Agencies do all sorts of other things. Um, and so you might you would want then to have in a small d democratic uh, vision of regulation, you would want agencies to be more robustly engaged with a wider range of folks. Um, now, like that's actually kind of hard to to do as a matter of like like requiring across the board a set of procedures, which is which is not what's in these executive orders. That then gets you into some of the like uh, uh, suffocation under procedure risks. Uh, but I think here too, there's sort of like a push in a different direction. Okay, my last minute, let me zoom out. These are very weedsy, but um, why am I cherry picking these examples? Uh, one, I think they're interesting and great and folks should you know think about them. Uh, but two, if part of our goal here is to envision what a blue sky democratic administrative apparatus that takes seriously the structural inequities in our society looks like, part of that task is going to require like, the day-to-day -day functioning of, of these organizations and humans to do that work. And I think in these different interventions, we see the beginnings of how one might go about structuring those day-to-day -day operations. And my hypothesis, which is for another paper, um, is that I think that also points towards what kinds of deeper, more transformative reorganizations, statutory interventions, doctrinal interventions might follow. But I am a big believer in like learn by doing. And so we should kind of learn by what's being done. Let me stop there. Uh, so thanks so much. Uh, and um, uh, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to be at this conference uh, and to uh, and to comment on these papers. So um, I, I, I will uh, comment on um, on each of the papers in turn, uh, starting with uh, Bijal Shah's uh, paper. So Bijal explains how agency management's pursuit of institutional virtues like conserving agency resources and maintaining a centralized control will tend to harm marginalized people, even if the managers don't necessarily have any animus toward those people or even any implicit bias against them. 
Uh, for example, uh, management faced with complicated factual or legal questions that need to be answered rapidly on a limited budget will cut down on decision-making procedures uh, and will privilege the kind of informational inputs that are cheapest to obtain. And those kinds of crude cost-saving strategies uh, are going to give short shrift to someone uh, and that someone will tend to be marginalized persons simply because giving them short shrift is the path of least resistance politically. I would like to pose one question about how Bijal defines and elaborates this phenomenon. In some of the examples, it appears that the agency possesses wide discretion as a legal matter, and the agency chooses a low process, cheap information approach as one of several paths that is legally open, and the chosen approach then hurts marginalized people physically or economically. But in other examples, Bijal seems keen to point out that the agency's institution-preserving approach, say its reliance on cheap uh, information, doesn't just hurt marginalized people, but it does so in a way that involves inaccurate fact-finding or misapplications of the statute. And my question is, does it actually matter that the agency gets the facts or the law wrong over and above physically hurting marginalized people or shifting resources away from those people. Uh, if, if physically harming marginalized people or shifting resources away from them is somehow aggravated when it's done in violation of the agency's statute or is done on the basis of inaccurately finding facts that the statute designates as a predicate for its application, does that imply that statutory compliance in itself is a good but but if it is, d does that mean that Bajal means to claim that these statutes are good and that compliance with them is a good uh, in itself, um, separate from just the the the, the raw uh, uh, distributional concerns? Uh, to to sharpen this point, uh, consider that there may be some situations, not as common as the ones in the paper where an agency pursues an institutional virtue in such a way that encourages violations of law that happen to help marginalized people. A few years ago, the Social Security Administration forced its adjudicators to start making decisions faster about whether to grant disability benefits. Grants of disability benefits are never individually reviewed, but denials can be. And so the adjudicators labor union alleged that the speed up would encourage adjudicators to make grants that were not warranted under the law because any adjudicator is because an adjudicator doesn't need to expend as much labor justifying a grant as a denial. If we assume that allegation is true and that disability applicants generally tend to be marginalized people. This may be an example of an agency pursuing an institutional virtue speed in a way that tends to violate the law but helps marginalized people. So my question is, would that be good or bad under Bijal's framework? Um, shifting now to, to Karen Tani's uh, paper. Uh, so you have uh, this, this striking uh, 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 story of uh, uh, disabled and elderly people who have this statutory entitlement to care uh, and a, a, a stream of funding uh, that is officially uh, supposed to go for that care. Uh, and a lot of the funding is being diverted uh, by, the, by these intermediaries, by the, by the providers. Um, and so this is, and, and, many, and many of the providers are, are, uh, are private uh, profit-seeking firms. Um, and so this is uh, the, the kind of context where you'd expect progressives to uh, you know, bring up and advocate for the idea of a public option. But in Karen's paper, uh, a, a lot of the examples, uh, some of the most prominent examples involve uh, nursing homes that are publicly owned, are owned by uh, state or local government uh, entities and are not, you know, profit seeking in the, in the conventional private firm sense. Um, and uh, the, these entities uh, seem to be engaged in behavior that's just as opportunistic um, as, as the rest of the as the rest of the providers. Um, and so I, I, um, uh, 
I, I wanted to hear more about uh, ab about what exactly the, uh, the the agenda and the incentives and the and the politics uh, of these um, government entities uh, that that own these opportunistic providers uh, uh, are, uh, and what are the implications of that uh, for the uh, for for possibilities uh, for reform? Uh, it, does it suggest that any kind of reform has to work on some kind of access other than uh, uh, excising the conventional profit motive uh, or, or or working along the lines of the conventional public-private distinction. Um, uh, and uh, uh, so, 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 uh, so I'd just be interested to hear, hear more about that. I would also be interested to hear more about what exact, exactly the implications of this uh, state and local government opportunism are for the actual distributional consequences here. What are the state and local governments using this money for? Or, or I mean, if we imagine that, you know, they're using them to stave off budget cuts, if their budgets were cut and they didn't extract this money from, you, you know, nursing home residents, what would be cut? Uh, in other words, I think, I, think we, I think we need some sense of, you, you, you know, how the state and local governments are, are using this money to get a full picture of the distributional consequences here. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, shifting to Sabil's paper, um, I, I, I mean, there's there's so much uh, to, to learn in this paper about the new types of structures of administration that can be instituted to promote progressive goals. I, I want to focus on a question that understandably is not the focus of the paper, but does loom over the paper uh, and is only briefly discussed in the paper. Uh, and that is the question of whether the kinds of reforms uh, discussed here can be sticky and durable, uh, as Sabil says on page 14. Um, so the question of durability is important because many of the reforms discussed seem like the kinds of things that would become more effective if they had long time horizons over which to develop. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of the classic work by Theta Scotchpole about the New Deal on why the NRA failed, but the AAA succeeded. It was because the AAA could draw upon administrative capacity and constituent relationships that had been built up by the USDA for decades preceding. Uh, Sabil refers to several specific means for improving administration that I, I think would work much better if they were given long time horizons. One, as he said in his talk, is learning by doing, which is great, but it often takes a long time. Uh, second is the buildup of trust relationships with constituents. Also takes a long time, especially if there's been very low trust previously. Um, a third would be a, a more effective and committed civil service, and recruitment into the civil service is helped uh, by the offer of long-run career prospects to, to sustainably do uh, the, the same kind of committed work. Uh, but of course, the time horizons for these reforms may be truncated or interrupted whenever the Republicans win the White House, a uh, point that Sabil acknowledges on, on page 44. Um, I, I mean, in general, we're in an era where each party on returning to control of the executive tries to destroy the institutional innovations of its predecessor. You know, this was documented uh, with regard to Trump by Freeman and Jacobs's uh, article on structural deregulation. And it also happened under Biden with the immediate ratification of Trump's uh, regulatory budget. Um, so I'd like to ask Sabil, what, what are the promising ways or are there promising ways to make the present reforms more durable if the Democrats don't always retain the White House? Uh, obviously, it would help to put the reforms in legislation, but that's hard to do. Uh, could you sometimes park administrative capacity outside the government and try to keep developing it? So it could then be returned into the government when the progressives return to power. Um, or, or could you take advantage of the fact that the agencies are so large and numerous and the White House is so small and has a mandate only for a subset of the agency's missions uh, and, and doesn't fully know or control its own core of appointees a lot of the time? Um, uh, pr pr presumably, the interagency initiatives will be salient to a new Republican administration and will be prime targets for rollback. But the intra-agency initiatives might survive in many cases, especially, especially if the Biden administration has been strategic about who to make them salient to. Obviously, a constituency outreach initiative, by definition, has to be salient to the 
constituency to which you're doing the outreach. But maybe it doesn't need to be made salient in the national media as a Biden-Harris initiative that will render it a target for the opposing party. Uh, and then lastly, could there be alliances of convenience between progressive Democrats and populist Republicans on certain discrete issues, uh, maybe something in antitrust, maybe the broadening of the application of the Paperwork Reduction Act, administrative burden, uh, and, and, and so forth. Uh, so, so thanks, and um, I, would, uh, I, I would like to give the panelists a minute to, to respond to one another and then open the floor to questions. Thank you for your thoughtful parsing of our work and, and for your, your helpful questions. Um, so I think it might be helpful, <clears throat> sorry again for the squeaky voice, it might be helpful to put this project in some context within my broader research agenda, which is I have a keen interest in how agency discretion operates. Uh, and I've been spending some time gathering information. It's the most brutal spade work <laughs> in many ways to try to figure out exactly what's happening on the front lines as a result of guidances and interagency memos and, and, and such. And so this paper is based in that keen interest, which is to say that I tried hard to focus on those aspects of agency action that are based in discretionary choices. Now, that isn't to say that there isn't overlap. So I think one example that pops to mind as you were speaking was um, how national and interna international terrorists are punished differently. Um, international terrorism receives a much higher level of punishment under the law. Um, however, agency uh, agencies have often... Um, even if they're operating in a domestic context, have um, gone ahead and labeled Muslim terrorists as international terrorists reflexively in some cases, which means that there's an inter interaction between the law and discretion there, right, where the law has these categories, but they're being kind of uh, conceived of in a certain way by the agency that then leads to these biased outcomes. So um, all of which is to say um, I think there is a lot of room in most of these examples for agencies to make choices, um, but to the extent that that's not the case and that statute is sort of clearly violated as a result of the agency's decisions, um, this, off this offers us another avenue for intervention, right, which I don't spend as much time with in this paper because my focus is discretion, or, um, but which is sort of legal intervention, intervention at the statutory level, intervention at the sort of regulatory level where we're changing what agencies do, um, uh, you know, if the statute is encouraging them to do this, or intervention in the form of litigation against the agency for breaking the law. So it kind of expands what we're able to do um, in response to agencies' behavior if the law is somehow shaping what they're doing. Now, as to your question of, you know, if the law encourages agencies to do good for vulnerable communities, what do we make of this? Well, uh, you know, your speed example has come up as well in the immigration context where people argue the fact that dockets are so slow that people's cases languish for so long is actually a problem for non-citizens. That means that they're in limbo for very long periods of time. They can't establish themselves. They can't get legal benefits that would result from, you know, status. And this is a problem. In fact, speed is better, um, notwithstanding the 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 kind of critiques of what speed does to the quality of the decision making. Um, so if if we're in a situation where, you know, speed improves and you know outcomes for vulnerable communities, that's great. Um, but I'm not so sure that the connection is as clear as you make it. So in a, I'm not super familiar with this um, social security um, guidance or the law that you talk about, although I'm really interested in looking into it. Um, but speed in that case might mean more grants because grants aren't reviewed, but who is getting those grants? Um, of course, this leads to sort of a bigger question that I'm still kind of struggling with, which is how do we define people who are vulnerable and marginalized more generally vis-a-vis -vis the administrative state, right? Are we talking about all disabled people? You know, when I look in, in, in some other work that I'm doing at the, at the community of social security, you know, welfare recipients, I'm not looking at people who are sort of claiming to be disabled because this would be the entirety of the population, right? I'm looking at, in, in some other work, racial minorities and, and women, for instance, who have um, uh, sort of historically received uh, fewer grants and have been treated in biased ways during social security administration processes. And so I'm not so sure that um, hurry up and grant will necessarily benefit those who I might define as marginalized in that particular population. Um, but all wonderful things to think about and thank you for your, for your feedback. Um, thank you for both my co-panelists. Those are really engaging and interesting presentations. And Nick, your comment was, you know, generous and astute uh, as always. Um, just quickly on the question of um, 
SSA grants and speed, I want to kind of call up Andrew Hammond's work on the Vallejo Madero case, because I think that's an example of where someone at an agency was um, not doing their job and didn't notice that this person who was um, born in Puerto, Puerto Rico, living in New York City, receiving SSI legally in New York City, moves to Puerto Rico to care for a family member at that point becomes no longer entitled to um, SSI for, you know, reasons that go back to the insular cases and, you know, unequal treatment of territories, right? But the agency doesn't catch this, right? Maybe because there are, somebody is sort of working too fast. And then the and the agency comes back and says, I think you owe like $28,000. Am I right, Andrew? Is that approximately right? Of back, <laughs> you know, back payment. So I think, again, to kind of echo maybe what Bajal is saying about we need to nuance maybe that, um, that example. Um, I really liked that that comment about how what is going on in these publicly owned, at least on paper, nursing homes kind of complicates a kind of go to progressive or liberal solution, which is the idea of a kind of public option maybe being, you know, a good idea. So I think that's worth thinking through. And I think the way that this one is sort of embedded in this federalist context in a way with a lot of money is on the line makes this one really complex. I guess I would want to be careful to say that like just because this example of public ownership has turned out really badly and seems to have many of the same ills as like nursing homes owned by private equity corporations. I think that doesn't mean we give up on the idea of a public solution. I think we it means we brainstorm about like what would be um what would be other public public alternatives. Um, and I'll kind of loop in because you had mentioned like what would be some reform ideas. These aren't ideas originally original to me, but Nina Cohn, people like Nina Cohn, Daniel Hatcher, they've written about like, you know, even if we were to stick with this as kind of a, a public option, I think there are things that could be done in terms of better tracking of payments, making sure they're applied in the way that they um, should be applied. In other words, to actually help the residents of nursing homes. Um, so that's one idea. I was talking to Kate Andreas before this about the labor piece and how maybe actually if you had um, better labor rights and protections, um, among the workers in these nursing homes, both public and private, right? That could be a dramatic improvement actually in the level of care that people receive there. So those are some reform um, possibilities. And again, I think other, other folks know much more about that than I do. Um, the question about um, state local opportunism and the diversion of revenue and where is that revenue going? That's a really interesting question. And it's something I kind of poked around with a little bit. I think it's very hard to kind of track the flows of money. Maybe there's a way to do this and I need to, um, you know, talk to some people who could help me figure this out. But I did look into kind of state, but, you know, generally like where are state when they have general revenue, like how are they allocating it? And I think it's a really interesting question. A big chunk of it is for education, which does raise, um, I think that maybe implicit in your question was this idea of if, if, if it's if it's being diverted into state coffers, maybe they're applying it to like good things that actually help the public in, in some way, right? And education is a, is a valuable public good. I still think there's something... Um, uh, objectionable about kind of the the shifting that's happening here. And then I think I would also call in the work of, um, so Tracy Steffes, a historian, has a new book out that's about um, the need to really look more closely at state legislatures and what they're doing with taxation and just sort of not assume that they can't raise more money. I think there's a narrative out there and it goes back to like the tax revolts, right, of the 70s. And right, and there are legal constraints that arise from the tax revolts, but I think there are other ways in which states could generate additional revenue if they want to, but instead they kind of um, put forward this narrative of like, oh, we couldn't possibly, right, which I think helps justify tactics such as this. Um Really great. And just hearing you just talk now, Karen, make think what one thing maybe is underlying assumption, uh, or or I should say assumption for something for me is that like all of this would be a lot better if we just spend a lot more money on yeah. on government and on like good things for people. So just to like stipulate, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so um uh, so to think of, yeah, this is something that I've been like wrestling with and you've like, uh, you know, of course picked up on like the thing I was hoping not to have to like grapple with too much in the paper. Um, but let me, let me say a, a couple of things. One is actually, uh, at least certainly in this space, um, and in general, I, I do want to resist a little bit the notion that like, it's all just like political football back and forth. Cause like, if we can just step back for a second, say honest to God, not like uh, uh, not in a, uh, in a not as a on, on behalf of any political party, but on behalf of the public and a government that ought to serve the public, we all ought to want a government that serves the public, all of us, right, 
to not impose unnecessary barriers to accessing those benefits that Congress has already authorized and to actually enforce those laws on concentrations of corporate power that Congress has already authorized and to and like down and down down the line. Right. And to, by the way, to to make policy on the basis of on, of actual 2024 social science and and science, as opposed to 2000 era science, because policy based on old science is not scientific policy. Right. You don't. That's not how science works. So I would. So first, I would just say, like, just as a matter of like, what is good government in general? I would I think that the things that that I talked about are actually expressions of mm -hmm not in a partisan sense, an expression of what gov good government ought to do in general. Um, now, we live in the world. like that's These are things that are going to be contested. So what else can I say about this? Um, the second thing I'd say quickly um, is one of the things I find sociologically fascinating, and, and all the papers here and, and other papers today are pick up on this too, is um, like any longstanding institution, ag agencies have sort of these like sedimentary layers of ideas, staff, po protocols, policies, like, you know, there are things that like were put in place in the Reagan era that are still kicking around. And there are things that are then like Clinton era stuff layered on top of that, Bush era stuff layered on top of that, Obama era stuff layered. And it's all kind of there, um, but it's all like kind of like in a mishmash and, and being worked together. And so just really concretely, you know, when the, uh, the customer service executive order came out, which was trying to sort of encourage agencies to improve access to government benefits and programs, you know, that built on a lot of good work that the Obama administration did on, you know, uh, bringing digital tools into any e-government tools into government. And so there's a way in which these things do build on one another over a longer arc. And so part of my hope, too, is like whatever twists and turns happen over the next, say, two to three to four years, I, I really do want to think for the next 10, 15, 20 years and what we what seeds do we need to plant now to and then see what works, right? See what, what flowers. And then the last thing I'll say quickly is um, institutions are also products of um, the larger configurations of uh, of political power in our broader society right and so it's true none of this like the new deal uh the new deal legacy you're talking about in part was also possible because there was a configuration of political power that a coalition that sustained itself for long enough to give those institutions time to flourish and get in, get embedded and then take on a life of their own i don't think that's where we are right now politically i think we have two you know the the balance of power and the fight is to like 50-50. Um, uh, 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 but I think that's a task then for those of us who are interested in organizing and social movements and the longer arc of um, uh, of envisioning and making real uh, a different side. And I think then the, uh, for those of us who do like this kind of administrative law work, um, one of the things I love about all the papers in, in, in this conference is we're not just speaking to you know clerks and judges. We are also speaking, I think, many of us to activists, citizens, communities, um, state and local policy. But you're right, we're seeing a wider range of people who are going to need to do all this stuff. So let me stop there. Great. So uh, I'd like to invite questions uh, from, from everybody. Uh, Kate Andreas. Uh, Karen, I wanted to follow up on and so, um, I was going to start with the quote we gave about um, the kind of analogy to the plantation. And why did you to think not only about the ways in which raising wages could potentially help you know, address some of these problems, but actually kind of how the exploitation of certain groups of workers and the kind of workers who staff nursing homes, right, is certainly more fundamentally connected to kinds of um, decisions about care and lack of care for swaths of the population. So that just sort of labor as a solution, but thinking about kind of how the two are maybe in a short, very deeply, the two forms of exploitation and state failure are deeply connected. Um, and then on your kind of second um, point about using um, history and social movements to think about alternatives, I think um, that the example you gave of the cooperative is really inspiring. I think there's many others we could line them as well. Um, including some kind of ongoing experiments now um, regarding trying to think about more like industrial policy, um, de democratic industrial policy in the, in the future paper um, for your know, thinking about nursing home care. So, but, um, and thanks to all of the leaders there with you. <laughs> I'll, I'll just say, th yeah, thank you so much. And I really look forward to uh, talking with you more, uh, you know, about your work in that context. And I would, yeah, like echo 100%. I think that plantation analogy could work on kind of in multiple registers. And I definitely agree that there, um, it would be important to think about like, who are 
who are the workers, what, um, you know, what, what groups they're, you know, themselves are probably coming from vulnerable groups. And I think the, um, the tactics that nursing homes are imposing when they have such low um, staffing would be these, I think, practices that probably dehumanize the workers in a sense, as much as they do the, the patients. So thank you for that. Questions? Uh, yes, uh, Kate. Uh, my question is for Karen. Uh, first, is a, a thank you for writing about this topic. Definitely near and dear to my heart. Um, and when it, you, you talked about it in your in paper, you wanted to start brainstorming about solutions. And in this slide, I thought it might be helpful just to, to, to get your thoughts on causing, like what is causing all of this. And there seems to be two paths that you look at. The first path is like the system is fundamentally broken and there's nothing we can do, so we require a radical reimagination. And this would be a, say, a view about you know, the inherent extractive nature of the capitalist state, is, or maybe it's um, a story about how, uh, because of changes for the economy, the industrialization, you know, the only stream of revenue available are like finance and healthcare, and so we're going to extract from the healthcare industry in the same way we extract income from the corporation So that seems hopeless and requires a reimagination. But there's another story where maybe everything is not broken, it's just been corrupted, right? And maybe this corruption is because of the death of the news, of lack of labor power as a countervailing power. So I was just, I just wanted to get your sense about like, the diagnosis of why this happened. I mean, I come from Ohio where you know corruption is not part of the I mean, that's a great question. And I'll just admit, this is a new project for me. So I'm thinking deeply, I think about it, exactly what you raise. And I'm not sure that I have um, I have an answer right now. The point that you raise about local news is really interesting to me in part because some of the best reporting on what was going on in the Tlefsky case and all this like, you know, very complex Medicaid diversion stuff going on, that was from the local paper, right? And I know that that, you know, those are kind of becoming ever more scarce. So I think that's a really excellent point in addition to the one, um, in addition to the, to the labor piece. And then in terms of broken system, I guess I, you know, coming from prior work, I am really concerned about just a kind of long-term devaluation of care work and of the people who need care. So that, you know, maybe draws me a little bit towards option one, but I realize that one kind of sounds like the most bleak. So I'll continue to reflect on that. And I really appreciate the kind of beautiful way that you, that you frame that and set that up. Thank you. Uh, questions, questions. Uh, yes, I, I I apologize. I won't know everyone's name, so please please go ahead and please say your name. This is having the agency physical governance of contracting with corporate entities to have to deliver the industries or even their goals like not being able to see the person and even thinking about data collection um, and where they can get from. How that kind of interacts with um, I guess some of the issues you were raising around the industry of state and also contributes perhaps to um, saturated disparities. And then also how that helps solutions in terms of kind of adopting a sort of neoliberal approach where the industry of state might run counterpoint to the yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So, um, you know, I can think of two sort of impacts of this outsourcing to private parties, which isn't new, and there's been some good work. You know, John Michaels has written a lot on this, and Bridget Dooling, and someone recently did some work studying how this operates at the ground level. Um, so, uh, you know, I look a little bit at um, instances in which agencies are, in fact, relying on information from one particular so this is a critique of procedure in which in agencies rely on information from a more sort of powerful and sophisticated party in order to sort of frame their decision, which of course excludes the situated knowledge of other people who may not have the same ability to, you know, work with data or make their views sort of known, right? So that's that's one way in which this kind of third party might also, um, I think, um, sort of corrode the process of decision making. If these third parties are funded by um, sort of powerful organizations or parties that have a stake in the decision making or otherwise have information that isn't sort of vetted for neutrality, um, uh, you know, and, and in keeping with that, it, it also sort of 
evinces a bias in favor of data and information and knowledge that is based in particular formats as opposed to, like I said, situated or ubiquitous knowledge that certain communities might have that have been excluded from processes. On the other hand, there may be, I think most of the people working on the private sort of public um, relationship might quibble with this, but there may be opportunities there as well, right? Um, if if third parties are representing, so there has been some movement in, in certain groups that advocate for communities before administrative processes to push for the kind of combining of information across communities in order to present it within notice and comment, and even within certain adjudications in a format that's um, more kind of um, the, what you know what the agency is used to. Uh, if if third parties are playing that sort of role or otherwise are are um, representative of perspectives that haven't been taken into consideration, of course those folks wouldn't be the ones that agencies tend to rely on in order to streamline their process, right? And so the it's sort of complicated how agencies are creating relationships. Um, but that having been said, I do think. You know, for instance, USCIS, I worked there for a pre brief period of time, had these interesting public-private partnerships that actually looked into what advocates and non-citizens were doing in ways that ended up informing policy there, um, at least at the time, under a different administration. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, it's a great question. Thanks. Questions? Uh, uh, Zach, let's go. So... In the paper, you bring up this tension between efficacy and procedure. And I, I'd love to hear more about your thoughts on that, especially given that in some of the other values that you brought up, some of the other initiatives uh, we tend to uh, add more procedure and potentially make them efficacious. You mentioned the you know, equity EO, which has more procedure that you need to go through, especially in the way of are already being overburdened, uh, which could potentially be concerning. Uh, and this is all on top of the fact that, you know, if you survey the public, you know, about whether government tends to work quickly or slowly, I think alone we would say government tends to work slowly. So, uh, curious what you think about this tension, especially as perhaps it's too long for government to work. Yeah. Yeah, this is something I've, I've thought a lot about. It's not as much in, in the paper. Um, but I should probably put more in the paper about this. Uh, so kind of like, Bajal, I'm sort of of two, of two minds about the procedure fetish critique, right, for 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 reasons that she laid out, that, you know, it, you need some procedures, particularly if we're trying to sort of bring back into the forefront um, communities or concepts that are historically and conventionally and easily skipped over. Um, but I think it's, it's different procedures. And so I think my instinct are, is um, almost a prosaic one, like, uh, you know, so would you, if you look at some of the participation ideas, like many of them are not. Uh, so, so one thing is it doesn't say it doesn't say every agency should do an advance notice of proposed rulemaking. That's a lot of procedure. What it does say is when agencies do their planning ahead for all the regulatory actions for the year, when they submit their regulatory agenda, which I, which everyone should pay attention to the reg agenda, um, that's when they should say here are our here's our plan for how we're going to engage communities in the year ahead on these actions that we are prioritizing in the year ahead. And if they don't have one, then they're gonna have to come up with one when they submit their, their reg agenda. And so this is a little example, but I think in general, there's a lot of, there's a lot more better we can do by moving a lot of procedural sort of uh, thing, uh, requirements of the kind that we want way upstream, right? Like way, way upstream, you know? And, and you start to see some of this in the industrial policy conversations too, like, we should want to think about the impacts on the environment and the impacts on, you know, communities uh, from a like permitting standpoint. I mean, this is your, your piece, Zach, but um, how could but we, but I think we could do a lot more of that at a sectoral level, at a regional level, at an upstream strategic planning level, where you sort of can put the ideas through their paces, but then you gain a lot of it, a process efficiencies of the right kinds that then allows you to then move much with much more alacrity. And I think there's a little bit of like some of the, that procedural gunk is on purpose to slow things down, but some of it is that I just don't think we've been as creative as we could be about balancing procedure and impact. Questions? Uh, yes, in the back row. See a little bit more about where you ended your comments in connection between the things you write about in the paper 
uh, and the very last few pages of the paper and, and broader structural change in the administrative state. And I think the tension that I'm I've also been thinking about some mm -hmm. is are the changes here things that actually lead to the bigger structures, or is this something that's just working within existing structures? And what I mean by that is you can interpret on the one hand kind of reforms to cost benefit analysis as just better cost benefit analysis, which is indeed what the Clinton administration did vis-a-vis -vis the Reagan administration, and the Obama administration did vis-a-vis -vis the Clinton administration and updating of science. But really the paradigm is the same. It's just you have more costs and more benefits and you do a better job of balancing. Um, similarly, you could see the competition work as, again, a different subject, but it's presidential administration just not on smoking, and now we're doing it on uh, competition policy. And so it's not a framework difference, but a topical difference. And the other approach is that maybe there's a the mechanism is these subject matter changes over time build power to then lead to legislative changes that do transform the administrative state. Um, another possibility is that these changes are actually different in kind than previous science changes or participation changes. So they are actually structural change, even though they may appear to be updating science, as you, as you said. Um, so how do you think about the like these changes relationship yeah. to getting to this bigger kind of process or administrative state changes that you're yeah. you gesture to at the end of the paper? Yeah, I think, and this goes a little bit also, it, it, it resonates with, I think, what, what Nick was putting on the table. Um, uh, so quickly, I, I think a, a couple things about this. What, one is that I do think there's a way in which um, the longer term mechanism for for kind of more fulsome structural change of the kind that, you know, both Karen and Bajal are pushing us to think about and, and others today, um, part of how we get there is going to, it's going to require other channels or it's going to require legislation, it's going to require more uh, kind of uh, organizing and so on. But I think there's things we can learn from these examples. Like, you know, for example, if you look at some of the regulatory reform bills circulating around the Hill, the John Paul Warren bill, for example, there's a lot of good stuff in that bill, but there's not as much stuff actually as like that might speak to some of the things that this whole panel is talking about. And so, uh, so that's, so that's one channel is like, okay, we can extract from these experiments, you know, uh, some pointers towards where we might need to do some more thinking about what we should do statutorily or what we should propose, et cetera. That's one channel. I think a second channel is sort of to Nick's uh, question, you need to build some muscle and some and some fluency and facility with these concepts and ideas. And I think there's there is no choice but to get agencies to start thinking about concentration and equity and you know different sources of data and evidence. That's all going to serve us well in the long run, even if by themselves they are not like like the sort of the the um the singular cause of a structural transformation. Um, and, and then the, the last thing that I would say about this is that um, at least in this paper, sort of my, my thought was, uh, so I, do, I don't think these reforms are, um, I don't think they were, they're, at least they're not framed explicitly as being themselves like huge breaks from the past. They're all by and large framed as con continuous, right? The, the cost benefit reform, that's what the executive order said, we are keeping you know, the long tradition and these are updates, right? And a number of the other executors have this flavor. Um, just thinking as like longer arc of historical institutional development, like I don't have a problem with that, right? I think that's actually how institutions evolve and develop over time. And the thing that will determine whether or not these are actual like starting points for transformation is what happens in the rest of politics over the next 10 years, not necessarily what happens sort of internal, purely internal to the agencies, which is why I'm interested in us thinking about this stuff. Questions? Uh, uh, Amy Kapchensky. Uh, one sort of comment and then a uh, question. So one, I think to Nick's point about public options, I think one thing that we're going to see sort of across the, the different panels is a kind of conversation about meaning of a different vocabulary we're talking about public options, public ownership, what the public is, because clearly sort of develop things about a public, you know, these are public programs and yet they're not public. If you start public in a certain dimension, you know, they're publicly owned or organized, and yet it's public means something that's really more normative about you know something that's democratic or that's responsive to the public speaking broadly, but like clearly they're not meaning of purposes. So so that's just one sort of thinking that either ownership status or sort of categorization, you know, is 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 a is it is, is a way to think about what's public. Um and and so so 
you know, to, to speak to some of the questions that came to you, Karen and Miguel, one way to think about some of those questions and, and questions I wanted to put to you is this privatization helping with the dynamics you're talking about. So that was sort of the old one, like public and bad, corrupt, infected, so it's privatized. Um, because then we'll get competition, and then we're going to get discipline and energy, and like we're going to get a choice between nursing homes, and we're going to get out of this dynamic of being. I, I mean, you just assume that you don't think privatization is in the realm of that kind of thing, but I'm curious, sort of, you know, some of these other things, like what does privatization do in this dynamic? Is it needed, actually, as opposed to actually trying to. Um, and then I was thinking about next question also to Miguel. I'm just wondering um, uh, what, uh, what, you know, the sort of what if Congress says about this? And I think your points, um, you know, were like, you know, well, obviously, Congress might not really say otherwise, there's a lot of discretion. Um, uh, there's another question, there's one point that I thought you raised really, it's really important, is how do we know, like, you know, you could think that the person isn't really disabled, but the whole point is we don't know until we get to the process that they're disabled, and so these practices are very hard to know, like, so we might not know. <laughs> but I guess I'm also wondering whether or not, as we're thinking in this overarching way, building new frameworks to the administrative state, what it means for it to be democratic, like, isn't there another tradition we're thinking about administrative law and administration, which sort of says like there's meta democratic principles, and the administrative state has to serve. And if it doesn't serve these, it isn't actually serving the broader purpose. It's kind of what we think about constitutionalism, like you know, judicial review is or isn't built into it because this is what constitutionalism means. And sometimes I feel like this is the way the proceduralist stuff in administrative law works. Like we get proceduralism because, of course, whatever Congress said about this or that, they must mean rational and effective administration. Or they must mean, I mean, I think cost benefit analysis kind of looks like this. Like, we're just going to assume that because this is what is, you know, in the making of a good administrative apparatus, like there must be CBA inside here. Um, or we're just going to assume that there must be good procedure inside here. Is it possible to think about that some similar sort of move, like for this to be democratic, there must be attention to how marginalized groups are now? But Congress said absolutely not. That's one kind of thing. But if, you know, if it's sort of the question of like, how should you operate? What do you assume democracy requires? Like, I'm not sure I'm articulating this super clearly, but I guess I think that there are meta level ways in which the conversations about administrative law often assume certain democratic principles that we ought to sort of interrogate and think maybe ought to be held in this. So thank you, Amy, for that um, helpful set of uh, comments. Um, I'll just speak briefly to your last point. I think so. From far away, this paper might seem to be sort of signing off on proceduralism more generally. In other words, you know, one might argue that most of the interventions look at ways in which procedure can be made more fulsome or data can be incorporated in ways that are sort of better as a matter of procedure. But I do think there is something distinct happening in here. And I think that, um, you know, just... Uh, Given Sabil's experience and 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 his paper and what he's sort of bringing forward in terms of the the incentives behind some of these EOs that may otherwise look like they're in keeping with kind of previous measures that presidents have taken, I do think that there is a greater recognition of this idea that good administration requires attention to sort of vulnerable and marginalized interests, sort of separate and apart from the ways in which proceduralism might support this. And I think this is an important intervention kind of as a theoretical matter as well, because the proceduralists are the people who tend to be liberal and progressive and their defense of the administrative state tends to come from a place of the administrative state is better for um, uh, you, you know, better for people and better for marginalized people. And that's the side that we're on, you know, against sort of conservatives. But proceduralism, I think, in some cases doesn't doesn't go far enough. I think in other cases, it might actually cut against, uh, you know, sort of depending on we might think of it as a pr proceduralist move to ask for data. But in the in, you know, in notice and comment, but the process of asking for data necessarily excludes certain perspectives. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, and I think that understanding that is really important to <laughs> progressive sort of pro administrativist mindset uh, that there is this other dimension of good administration that hasn't been covered by the things that we tend to sign off on in the administrative state. So. It's helpful to think about. Thanks.
I'll just um, chime in quickly to say I really I'm really grateful for your comment and for the coming forthcoming conversations about um, more nuanced way of thinking about the public option and a different vocabulary like what you said like democratic responsive and I'll just say one thing that I learned when I was you know trying to think about educate myself on the nursing home regulation context one of the reform ideas that I've seen floating around as like a good fix has to do with oh we can just um, force better reporting about who owns these things and then we'll give that information to the consumer. And then they will be able to make an educated decision. And I think to your point, these terms public and private, right? Like they they are not meaningful in a sense, right? And certainly I don't think could give a consumer a, a great sense of like what they what they are a family member could expect um, in one of these nursing homes. So thank you for that comment. Questions? Uh, Joy Milligan. <laughs> um, you know, when you think about this extractive logic that you described, I guess, you know, I automatically wonder, well, where did it come from? And I can't help um, but wonder if there's something inherent about the structure of civility about the funds, the way we move the funds around. Like, instead of thinking about it in terms of service delivery and care from the center forward, you're you know, transfer chunks of money between various sectors. You know, it's very simplistic. Like, so, and that of course sounds like, oh, we should just have federal programs from the start. But the flip side, the Atlanta story is like, oh, we need like grassroots collectives. So I was just playing with that in trying to think of that these new problems. It's like, you know, empowering the people of the problem. Uh, and we shall like talk about that. Yeah, and then Right now, um, yeah, yeah I, I just wondered. Um, I think you touched on part of this a little bit, so maybe the second part was more relevant. But um, to the extent as you thought about this paper, and I, I really appreciate your point that we always will have to think about how we wire the administrative state, no matter what huge gains we gain in other in other political fora. I did wonder, like, how do you think about where the scope of this is potential comes out? Both two possible and opposite kind of things I saw possibly in the paper, which is like what we have accomplished through executive branch power versus you know others we touched on legislation. Um, but then the second part, which is the last question, is kind of the, the, the power of transcendentalism. You know, I think of agencies with like really distinctive things, like you know, how we set education, um, really different institutions, things like designs and um Characters. So, how do you think about like, where the trends are coming from? Uh, I thank you so much for that comment, and I think you and I love to think together about spending clause. You know, kind of across the the state. I will say, I think there is a distinction between a program like Medicaid and something that's more um, that kind of physically goes into the hands of the beneficiary. And I think the extraction obviously is much easier when it's sort of something that's sort of in the air and that a provider, you know, basically goes into the, the money goes to the yeah. provider as opposed to goes directly into the hands of a person who has some discretion as to how they're gonna, you know, spend the money they get or, or the um, like, you know, food benefits that they that they get. But I, I take your point that maybe there, it's, it's kind of worth thinking about this across the, um, across the spending clause context. So thank you for that. Um, no, super, super interesting and helpful, uh, Joy. Thank you so much. And I guess two two things I'd say about this. Um, so one is actually I do agree that there's a uh, a limit to sort of transformation by executive order, uh, in part because like I mean part of my fascination with like the sociological operation of any and it's not just like for government like. Before going to government, I was running a think tank and like, you know, running an organization of 50 humans to get them to do things and 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 deal with all the conflicts that arise, whatever. It's like, it's actually like, I'm not fascinated with this set of questions about organizational culture and and dynamics and like sort of the soft 
mushy, but very real stuff of it, which sometimes maps onto formal protocol and directives, but oftentimes does not. So in that sense, there's a limit. There's another limit of what Nick and Ganesh are flagging, right? That it can just be um, overridden. But I think on the trans substantive thing, my instinct on this, uh, and we have a paper on this topic, you know, later in our session um, conference, but uh, my instinct on this is, is somewhat Amy's, right? That I think I do think there are trans substantive values and concepts and ideas, but they are in the of the normative flavor of a set of presumptions that we ought to have about what democracy is, what uh, equity is, um, a, a kind of uh, commitment to anti subordination as definitional to good government in a trans substantive way. But then how we operationalize that really does have to be particular. So when I look like look at Karen's story and the examples that Bijal is giving, like part of what pops for me is like, oh, HHS has a ton of enforcement powers, but they are like actually not used to thinking about their enforcement powers like in the mode of tackling private equity first or in the mode of you know using their spending authorities. Other agencies are actually very good at thinking that way and have better like like muscles of that sort not for any legal reason but for a whole host of sociological institutional inertia reasons right and so that's kind of where my head goes uh with five minutes perhaps we could co collect uh questions uh questions questions uh oh, oh uh, uh yes go ahead please follow proceed your analysis of actual material mm -hmm. interests of the people you mm -hmm. mm -hmm. click. Uh, further questions? Uh, further questions? Uh, uh, yes, uh, David Frumkin. So, to talk about the question, which we're talking about more, and it's also related to Digital's paper, is you know, whether bypassing the administration is actually one of the central things that we need to think about. Conversation, you know, the, the discretion problem and the fact that, you know, administration is really necessary for things like means testing or, or you know, desert, desert testing. Uh, and instead, if you provide direct benefits to beneficiaries, you can actually bypass some of these administrative uh, issues. So that's something we should be thinking more about upstream. Thank you. Further? Uh, yes. For you in this extractive operation, is there sometimes where it sounds like it's either you know public you know agencies, although we question the term public, or contractors? And in that case, the solutions seem like some kind of old-fashioned, very traditional administrative responses. We want more efficiency. We want to work on that system. You know, we save save money because we're avoiding any waste. And other times, it sounds like it's um, more systemic. I mean, the, the vision of a term that we call extractive. Where it's a political problem to kind of allocate resources away from people. And that seems like it points to a whole different set of solutions. So I wonder, like, well, what's it take to call the whole system extractive? And whether that as an analytic term kind of clarifies something or whether it's hiding something or just generally how we think. Thank you. Uh, yes, please go ahead. Yeah, just one question. Look like if we're just putting public input and advisory in the same kind of industry as marketplace of ideas with industry lobbying and all the kinds of informal relationships that stakeholders do build with the administrative state, um, are there more influence limiting reforms that we should put on the industry side and what agencies interact with on a daily basis and um, might actually lead to better empowerment of a public perspective, a truly public perspective in the agency? Thank you. Uh, we have time for one one more question. Uh, Blake Emerson. One through line here is benefit programs versus regulation. I wonder whether that is accurate or whether it is going up. And I think old traditional thing. Does that help us figure out the problem or does it actually obscure things the way it's not wrong? Uh, Amy, Amy, we're at twelve thirty. Do we want to have like one word from each panelist? 
So I'll speak um, uh, really briefly to what about no agencies and to the concept of capture and then maybe benefits versus regulation. Um, so <laughs> this idea that there should be no administrative state is championed by people who see it as uh, unconstitutional, as well as by people who kind of fetishize the private sector and say they behave with greater efficiency, they'll manage our money better, we don't want to throw money at agencies. But that, that critique tends to be sort of focused on all of the things that agencies are making choices to preserve in many of the cases that I'm looking at. So I'm not so sure that making a third party uh, the decision maker here would be to the benefit of some of the values I'm trying to see infused into these processes. Uh, on the other hand, if we made um, Congress in charge of, of sort of creating policy that skipped a middleman and went straight to being implemented, you know, the, the argument of the anti-administrativists, we might see so much um, uh, sort of reduction in efficiency and expertise that uh, maybe things would swing in a direction that uh, uh, would also not be a good kind of s s situation for upholding some of these equity values. Um, absolutely, there's a story of capture, you know, situations where in, in, in my cases, situations in which, for instance, um, those who are part of notice and comment or adjudicate part of an adjudication, um, providing information that the agency relies on is also a story of capture by that party, right? Um, I think what's interesting it, to me, it, you know, in this work is looking at the, the kind of dynamics between the external uh, kind of Cap effects of the kind of externally um, motivated or uh, effects of capture and the kind of in in incentives that are endogenous to the agency and seeing how they sort of interact in many of these situations. Um, I have lots to say about the regulation benefits um, breakdown that I'm going to hold off on for now so others can speak. So thanks. I'll speak um, quickly to Nathaniel's great question about extraction and whether um, it's it's kind of worth greater, greater nuance. I think if the goal were to kind of really go straight for the reform point, I think it would really pay off to think about the differences, you know, between these different types of extraction that the paper covers. I think the aim of this, uh, and that's a worthy goal, I think the aim of this paper was more actually to tether what's happening here to some context that I didn't mention in my remarks, including, for example, Daniel Hatcher and my colleague Dorothy, Dorothy Roberts have done great work on how um, foster care systems basically like as soon as a child even kind of enters into their tendrils, they immediately try to figure out which flows of entitlements that child has access to and then suck those up, right? So that's like an extraction helping elsewhere within the state. Similarly, um, Eleanor Wade has a great paper on how states um, seize portions of uh, Medicaid recipients' tort recoveries, right? If they happen to like get a settlement from a car accident or something, right? So I think there's an incarceral, right? There's like lots of work on fines and fees and the kind of policing carceral context. So the work I think that extraction is doing for me that's helpful is to kind of connect this to those other contexts. Uh, great. Really quickly, um, uh, on entity subordination, I, I, I think it's a, I think it would be actually a general principle that would hit on how we do enforcement, how we do regulations, how we do benefits delivery, and, and maybe that's worth uh, sort of unpacking a little bit more. Uh, capture, absolutely. I think it's a whole external set of things to talk about capture, but part of why I'm interested in the things I talked about is the whole kind of like informal sort of epistemic or or cultural capture that, that uh, shapes a lot of how agencies function in terms of just like shared presumptions and data and inputs and sociological backgrounds, et cetera. I think part of how we tackle that is sort of thinking about the internal. Um, and then on uh, where the values come from, I think it's both, right? Like uh, it's because we had a massive social movement demanding action on climate and in in a way that is uh, directly focused on racial justice that you get things like the Justice 40 program, which then forces a whole set of different day-to-day -day internal like things that agencies have to figure out. Please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you.